coming or not? Uh, Other than Andy? Two city councilors who've accepted the meeting should be participating at some point here. And David Newlove also accepted. Okay, let us start this meeting on a call to order. And uh, Wednesday, June 24th, 2020 at 4 p.m. A meeting of the Economic Development Commission. First order of business is acceptance of the minutes from May 27th. Uh, Steve, I just have to make that statement because we're doing this virtually, if I could do that. Yes, that's correct. I'm sorry. This Same. meeting is being conducted in the accordance with the provisions of RSA 91A and emergency order number 12 issued by the governor of the state of New Hampshire. It, we are, this meeting is being conducted virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not practical for the Economic Development Commission to meet in person or to allow public participation in person. The public is allowed to participate by computer link or by dialing in by phone. If anybody is dialing by phone, if they wish to speak when they're recognized by the chairperson, dial star six, and that will allow you to speak and be heard on the call. Mr. Chairman, back to you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'd like to have a, I guess we can see everybody who's here. So um, that's fine. We'll go forward from here. Could I have a... Motion to accept the minutes. So moved, Dan Nash. Second. Thank you, Dan. And a second. Chip Brown. Second. Thank you. All right. Any discussions of the minutes from last uh, May? Ah, our new member is arriving. Welcome, Andy Key. Hi guys, how are you? Sorry, I'm a minute late. Good to see you here. Thank you. Hey guys. Hi. So we just start reading in a minute, Sandy. Oh, okay. Well, then. Okay. Yep. And uh, any questions on them that anybody has? I haven't heard any yet. So I'm ready. Uh, what was it? Half a bag that was in. Uh, yeah, a lot of bags. This morning was it? Yeah. And then I use, there was another quarterback. Talks. I didn't follow that, Chip. It sounded like somebody was speaking in the background. Oh, it's muted now. Anyway. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to have to have a voice vote. I mean, a uh, announcement vote where you announce your vote. So, um, Dan, I'm going to start with you. Uh, about yes. About, repeat your name and your vote. Dan Nash, I vote yes. Next. Chip Brown, yes. Kevin Purcell, yes. Bill Dunn, yes. Steve Whitman, yes. Andy, you're uh, abstaining, I presume, and uh, who does that leave? I think that carries. Okay, motion carries. Got it down for the minutes. Okay, we open up the discussion for a strategy for downtown redevelopment and West Lebanon redevelopment. The word is strategy. Okay, so right now, as you know, our main focus in the downtown area is 20 uh, Spencer Street. The lot has been cleared. That's the city DPW site. The buildings have been torn down, and we're just getting waiting for final approval on the environmental from uh, uh, for uh, Crederi Associates that's doing that. And, and then DE has to sign off on that, which will probably be another probably 60 days before we get that. We have a draft development agreement. It's we're just fine tuning it. It's pretty much done with um, Ken Braverman and just a slight change in direction that we, we're trying to get more um, workforce housing in there, like 45% of it being workforce housing, which is actually about 41 to 42 units. And those units will be within the range of 60 to 100%. Some of them will be within uh, the range of 60 to 100% of median income. 
and then some of them will be, be between 80 and 100 percent of median income. Uh, people in that range would be able to occupy those units. We're still talking about 91 to 98 units, so it's around you know 45 units, 46 units, something like that. That was in that range. Originally, we were looking at 10, nine or 10 units. Um, so this is uh, a change, I think, in the positive direction. It's not finalized yet because we have to get uh, approval from LITAR on the, uh, the State Housing Authority on that. So we're getting pretty close on that. Uh, we are moving forward with the redevelopment of uh, the reconstruction of Spencer Street. In fact, we have, it's under engineering review right now. And we expect by mid-July, we're going to have some initial cost estimates on that. Our plan is to take the $1.5 million for the sale of the property at 20 Spencer Street and use that to redevelop the whole street there, repave the road, uh, sidewalks, uh, the drainage, water and sewer lines, which have to be done. So it'll it'll basically create a whole facelift for that whole neighborhood over there. And that's that's the present plan we're working on right now. And that'll go before the council in December for the funding for that. But again, we're looking at using that cash and flipping it and just putting it right into the project and matching it with the, with the public, the private funds which are being invested to, to build that area up. So that's the that's the plan right now. We are not moving forward at this time on anything else like the back parking lots, because my focus is on that. I only have limited resources in the planning department to do this. So he's working on that. And at the same time, we're shifting emphasis over to the West Lebanon uh, neighborhood over there. Um, David is working to put together the plan on that. We've already had this shred. I think you're all aware of that. Now it's a matter of implementation items, hiring an engineering firm to look at the engineering pieces that have to be done. We're still waiting on final approval from uh, DOT on the Westboro yard, whether that funding is actually going to be available to us or not. Um, as you know, what's in the state budget. However, the state revenue situation is precarious at best, and it's unknown whether that money is actually going to be committed to the project. Our conversations with uh, DOT have been such that they are moving forward as if they do have final approval for the release of the funding. The environmental review has, is being completed and the cultural resources review is being completed. And we have asked to be participants in that part of the process, the cultural resource part of it. Our Heritage Commission and Historical Society will be involved in that. That will probably be basically taking a video of the site as it is and the demolition of the site. And there may be a kiosk or something of that nature to record the history there. That's probably what that's going to amount to. Their plan is to go out to RFP on the 28th of July, I think is what they said. But that again remains to be seen. I'm very skeptical that money is actually going to be available for that project, which is very unfortunate for us. It took a lot to get it in the state budget after many years of pleading with them to do so. It's um, if we don't get it in, in this, if it, the money's not allowed to be spent, it's already in the budget this year. We'd have to fight for it again the next budget process, and that could be a challenge. So again, our, our efforts are, try, are now moving towards West Lebanon to get that whole neighborhood redeveloped over there in accordance with the visioning plan and the, uh, the uh, charrette that was done there. Any questions about that plan strategy? And I'm looking for input from you folks on this uh, commission in that regard. This is Bill Dunn speaking. Could I could I uh, just go back to Spencer Street as a topic, if I may? Yes. So, uh, and, and Sean, if you can't answer this, that's that's fine. But the original uh, program that was put forth was a 10 percent or about nine units uh, in the workforce housing with the sale price of a million five. I heard you mention the increased number of units for uh, uh, workforce housing, but I still heard you mention the million five. So I'm assuming the dollar amount isn't changing, that there's some other sorts of negotiations that are happening to make that mix change. Yes, because he, he would get some funding from the Hampshire Housing Authority to help offset that. He'd be able to borrow money at a, at a, a smaller, uh, lower rate. So falls in the category of a win-win. Yeah, exactly. For both of us, he's, you know, he's he's done very similar projects up in Vermont, up in Winooski. Uh, so this is typical of a lot of the work that he already does. So the, the original 10 units, nine or 10 units, they were going to be from the 80 to 100 percent range of median income for Grafton County. And now we've got 45 units. A lot of those will be between 60 and 100 percent, and there will be some between 80 and 100. And then the remainder of the balance of the units will be market rate. Thank you. 
Sean, did you say that the uh, uh, sale of the land was four point five million? I wish. No, it's one point five. One point five. <laughs> uh, yes, I wish. I guess. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? I mean, obviously, I, I'd prefer not to wait on the down on the other parts of the downtown redevelopment, but this is the first real foray the city has done into something like this since the fire in, in the 1950s or 60s there. So this is different for us, and I think we need to get ourselves grounded in this first project, uh, take our lumps, learn our lessons, whatever they may be on that, before we start to venture into a much larger project in the downtown area, if that makes sense to everybody. I, I think the uh, idea of reinvesting the sale uh, proceeds makes an enormous amount of sense, and you're you're making a focused effort, and that's the way to turn that street around. And um, you know, I think uh, it makes sense to me. That that hasn't been approved by the council yet. I've talked about that, but I mean, they, you know, they haven't. That hasn't been approved yet. That that'll be part of the budget process, and that I don't expect any objections to that. But I mean, they may have other, they may view it differently because there's other ways you could do this. The city could borrow that the money necessary for that work. Uh, we could use TIF money to do that, which I don't think is a good idea. And I met with the downtown TIF advisory board last night. We went over their budget. Uh, they've got for the first half tax bill, they now have forty one thousand dollars in their account. Uh, the second half will be a larger amount due to the reval. Uh, and I suggest to them that they not spend that money and they agree that that's the case, that we're going to uh, present a zero budget for next year for the TIF district so we can save that, which will allow for that downtown redevelopment in the future, mixing uh, public funds with private funds to enhance our economy here and build a, you know, a better downtown area by working together in a partnership. That's the long term goal. That was part of the visioning. Uh, concept and sure. whether that visioning concept is going to be what we carry on with remains to be seen. Some people are opposed to that or have concerns about that. So I, I just don't know what, where that's going to go. And you folks are going to have to weigh in on that. Sean, the uh, uh, timing of it's getting presented, the idea of investing that money gets presented to the board when and if if it's accepted, uh, what would the timing be on the street improvements? We're looking at 2021. That's why what we did was we we had a budget of $300,000 for the 20 Spencer Street project and it came in under. So we took that the council authorized me to take uh, the balance of that money and use that to, to do the engineering right now. So we're ready for 2021. So when Braveman does his work, we'll be doing our work at the same time. It'll, yeah. it'll be dovetailing each other. That's the plan. Excellent. And that's the first time we've done something like that, too. So that'll be a first for us working with them. Uh, two different engineering firms working working together to uh, make sure things line up properly and we don't have heavy equipment driving over newly paved roads and that sort of stuff. Um, West Lab is uh, in terms of activity, anything new with Clem's project? I, I haven't heard anything. There's work being done down there, some earth moving work. As he's got equipment down there. And I think he has his building permit, I, but I can't. There, there was some finalized for the first building, his building permit for that. I think yeah. he might have that by now. Um, we're also talking to him about uh, one of the one of the sites that's actually on on Route 10 for a uh, station number two replacement. We're looking at uh, remove, uh, building a new fire station, and we're in discussions with him on that right now. But other than that, nothing nothing new. Yeah. I have to get a little meeting, find out if they have an anchor there. Is that it? Just it seems like. You know, so it's like Leb downtown. You know, you need you need one project to kind of anchor more activity, and in West Leb, I think that's even more so. Um, so, I'm I'm hopeful that he will, in fact, kick off. Um, I had heard that he the building permit was 
imminent, uh, but I, I have to follow up with that. So anyway. Um, yeah, there were a couple of items left, but I think they're resolved. Yeah. Um, and was the gist of, did we talk about last meeting, uh, there was some discussion of what to do with a waterfront and it sounded like in terms of potential uh, water access or water uses it, from David's comment, if I recall, it sounded kind of limited, but is that, is that the case? Yeah, we, we did a site walk out there about a month ago now. Myself, David, DPW director and Parks and Rec director to look at that. And the ability to launch a boat down there, it, because of when they release the dam, the uh, the current is so strong there and we'd have to build a structure. And the way it drops down, it's all rock there, but it'd be very difficult to put a boat landing in there. And originally uh, the city was supposed to get more land, but they had to move the bridge more towards the south so we have less land and the ability to to, uh, to allow for handicap access. Uh, we don't we can't make the slalom adequate enough to get down that slope with the right grades to do that. Yeah. So that doesn't seem practical. What we did do, we walked the path of what would be the trail that's been talked about in the original uh, string of pearls yeah. that goes to the Westboro yard. There was uh, when I first got here, there was an original discussion at the bridge, uh, the railroad bridge the head height was was very limited and that people couldn't walk under, but I walked under it and it's like 10 to 13 feet. So there's plenty of plenty of head space in which to do that. It might be difficult for heavy equipment in there, but I think they can get that from both sides. So I think that's a very viable. We, again, we walked that path. We have a sewer uh, easement over that that very land. And it's with, with a whole not a whole lot of improvements. That can be a, a decent path that's made there. So I, I think that's very viable. A path and, and view amenity there, but but really not a water uh, amenity there. Water no. amenity, yeah. And and I urge you, if, if you have a moment, to go down and take a look at that existing little park called Bridge Park because it doesn't, doesn't have a name. But just take a ride down there, and it really is not practical for a boat landing. Yeah. Uh, you'll, yeah. you'll see when you look at it. Check it out. So the, the, the key to that, of course, is the Westboro Yard. If we can get this finalized with the Westboro Yard, and we were there, but I, I just think that funds are just not going to be available to us. So there's that. There's also the piece where we tore down the house at the corner of Elm and um, Seminary Hill Road. Uh, the council at some point is going to have to decide on that, and we should weigh in on that, what we think should happen with that. Um, some people wanted to have it be a park, and it's really not a great place for a park. We did get approval from DOT with the bridge project. They will put a retaining wall in there, 11 foot retaining wall. And also they'll build that they'll reinforce that wall such that we can build that wall higher to make more of that land that's there. That might be a, a viable piece of commercial property for the city to sell. So that, you know, this is one of the things that you folks might want to think about weighing in on and make a recommendation to the council what you think should be done there at some point. Um, the other thing that we have going is um, Barry Schuster did a project for the city. He did a gratis in, in terms of the legal work to get the Mascoma Greenway. Um, I would like to pay him to lobby for us and go through the process to allow us to complete that path to Riverside Park. Uh, the railroad says it's an active railroad, but yet there's trees growing up in the middle of it. I find that difficult to believe. Uh, we have spoken to our legislative delegation um, our, our, our two senators and our state rep, uh, their staff seems to think that we can win this fight, but it is a fight that has to be weighed and it has to be, and, and Barry Schuster actually had, has done this before. Hey, so we, hey, we've been, in, 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 where, where are you talking about? I'm sorry. So where, where the Mascoma Greenway ends right now, yeah. uh, where the bridge is there, uh, it would continue on all the way. There's two other bridges before you get to Riverside Park where the skate park is there. Yeah, the, the the stone arch just before you get to that stone arch, because the railroad does back uh, trains up right to about where the stone arch is and just a little bit beyond that. But after that, it, it, they don't do anything because those bridges allegedly cannot handle the trains. So we'd like to be able to extend that trail all the way down. And if we can do that, then we can use the path of the penstock for the dam, which would bring us literally right 
uh, where the uh, uh, right on the 12A. That'd be great. You know, connection. We can we can link up that entire connection in there. We should make a safe path by people people could walk and ride their bicycles and as they do now on the existing Mascoma Greenway. So that's the other part that we're working for to push that through that final distance there. Sean, that um, at the time that we worked on that many years ago, it was also thought that you could come uh, down from uh, the uh, other side of the process down uh, north north of uh, West Lebanon Bridge. Right, Iron Horse, and all Horse. along, right, along yep. the river there, and. Uh, because that one of the problems, of course, is crossing 12A. Uh, right. But if we can get people in the two 12A, then the new the new sidewalk network now is complete from one side. To, well, uh, on the Walmart side, all the way up to the to the uh, Powerhouse Mall, we have a sidewalk network now that's complete, from one yep. end to the other. They just completed that, so we would be able to link into that, and we'd have a continuous sidewalk network. All the way to the downtown area, basically, that people could use safely. And it just enhances the quality of life for everybody who lives here that people are looking for. And I don't know how, how many folks use the Mascoma Greenway. I do, and there's a lot of folks out there using that trail, biking and walking, and oh yeah, it's pretty active. That could be a really huge economic driver to have you know access to that, and particularly if there's places where people who are walking or biking can then get off the trail and shop and grab something to eat. Uh, you know, studies have been done on that, that it really drives economic development to have that. And we've seen that in the Rock, on the Rockingham Trail in the southern part of the state, very, very active. And it does just those things right through downtown Derry, and, uh, um, Salem and um, London Derry, very, very active. There's a, a trail from Nashua to uh, Averill, Mass, and a study was done by Nashua Regional Planning, and they determined that on any given fall Saturday, about 1,200 people use that trail. And there's an ice cream store uh, about halfway, and let me tell you, that could be like 40 people deep waiting to get an ice cream on that trail. So th these are definitely great economic drivers yeah, and it's that quality of life that people are looking for they want to live someplace that has those amenities that that they enjoy yeah i know uh you know with uh spencer street um we have you know ken spencer backing up to the to the rail trail and and ken's project adjacent to that and you know we're noodling thoughts on on uh, uses for that for 10 Spencer Street and you know it, it just it leaves a lot of opportunity so it should be fun well on that ship just another thing too we have another CIP project that Parks and Rec put together that will allow us to pave the northern rail trail uh, from Spencer Street right behind those buildings all the way to Bank Street oh that's so, correct well yeah. that's $120,000 and there's some drainage work that has to be done right about where behind where the old junior high school is which we think we can do with force account labor there. If we can, when we bid the project for Spencer Street, all the pro the construction projects we're bidding are all coming significantly under budget. If by ha by happenstance we can do that on the Spencer Street reconstruction project, I might be able to have enough funds with that one point five million dollars to do to pave that rail trail as well, and that would really boost up that whole neighborhood right there. Really improve the quality of that neighborhood. Uh, I would agree. I think that would be a great idea. So I've got that as a contingency plan ready to go. I, I just I can't fund it otherwise. I just don't have enough money. But if the pro, if the one point five million, if that can be stretched enough, and these bids come in next year for that under, we might be able to do all of that. And again, they went re are really building up that whole neighborhood over on that end. You know, we might. Uh, I, I'm I'm brainstorming here, but we might. Um, also reach out to some of the uh, more community-minded um, companies like Geocon and 
BioXL, et cetera, and see if when some of these um, projects come up, if they would sponsor sections or we can kind of uh, do a little grassroots fundraise. That would be a good idea. And I know uh, Peter Glenshaw from uh, um, Alice Peck Day, he's an avid runner. He uh, had asked that when we get these projects ready, if we would reach out to him on that. So I, I plan to do just that. Yeah, I, I, you know, particularly the trails are, you know, it's such a, uh, a great community amenity and it's something that the big organizations and every arch HR group is, is focused on, so. Sean, so the, I have a, another question for you. How's the uh, tunnel coming and what's the plans for It's on that? schedule. It's, it's on schedule and it's within budget. It's the substantial completion will be in, in November, unless something changes. Uh, and we'll be doing plantings next spring to finalize the project. But it should be open in November. Again, should, provided there are no delays. We don't have a major outbreak of COVID-19 that stops construction or delays construction or materials or anything like that. Uh, right now we're on schedule. Well, that brings up COVID. So maybe we should be switching and talking about that for a few minutes here. But can I just, can I get just, uh, uh, does the, the strategy that we're talking about, does it make sense? Should we change any of that? This is just me talking. I, I don't, policy is supposed to be made by people like you folks and ultimately the council. So I'm really looking for some feedback. That's just the idea that I, I've i developed based upon what has already been done by others in this city and other plans. Does it make sense? Should we modify any of that? Are we on the right track? Sean, this is Bill Dunn. Uh, I think linking that last bit of the Mascoma Greenway down to the skate park makes a tremendous amount of sense. And I was on a, at a meeting last night for arts and culture where we were uh, partnering with uh, bike pad and such, or lab rec, excuse me. And uh, if, if that link was established, I think it, it provides um, not just a uh, opportunity for younger folks, but also some commercial activity as well. So I, I'd be an advocate for uh, allowing Barry to see, Barry Schuster to see what he could do by making a case for the city to take that action. Very good. I would like to uh, add a, a thought to this process. Um, although the uh, r the trails are right now our focus and that makes sense to me, I think we also want to keep in mind uh, ultimately where we head with this whole type of project. We want to make sure that we are bringing people into downtown at the same time so that the trails don't uh, lose sight of that. We've got the, the river focus and these are long term projects, but, um, you know, I think we've just seen what can happen when uh, the restaurants open up in the, the middle of the mall and change the patterns. People also want to be in that downtown park. Uh, and uh, it's a real asset for us to make sure we're developing that. Yeah, and at some point we should talk about that. I mean, I put that together in basically a week because that's all we had for time. Yeah. Uh, but some more thought needs to be put into that if we're going to continue to do that. A lot of people are asking about that. If we're going to continue, to, they, they like the environment, the, the, the atmosphere that it creates. All right. Uh, both of the, the business owners here are bringing in patrons from far greater distances than they've ever brought in them before. People from 30 miles away are coming to to enjoy the amenities here, which is, of course, exactly what we want. Uh, there are some folks that do have concerns about it. And I think that should be a future agenda item we should probably talk about in more detail and maybe invite the two business owners to talk to us about their thoughts on that. And uh, the council really didn't have a whole lot of time to respond to this because none of us did. Uh, I mean, they approved the liquor license for both locations, but I'm going to want them to really be on board with this. They were, but I mean, you know, I, there needs to be yeah, more, well, more discussion about it. Again, we just we just we did this in a week because we had to. Well, look, I I would you know my input on on some of these questions is, you know, if activity begets activity, and and I think you know from the trails to the the outdoor dining. All of that is a positive, and it's a positive to not to not other parts of the city, but downtown. It, it will, it you know, it, it's 
it will draw even more people into Lev, whether it goes they're local going to West Lev to shop via bike or whether they're going to um, come into town and and uh, eat <clears throat> eat it off the green. Um, uh, you know, seeing people out, having people out uh, brings more people in. That's what people come for. So I, I think it's all good. I, I would. I would definitely agree with that. And I think if you look at trails like this that connect with downtowns and other areas, you find that those businesses see an increase in business. Uh, pe people love to be able to get on their bikes or ha be able to walk to places where they can eat or, you know, do recreation and, and not have to worry about traffic. So I, I think that you know, our downtown businesses would definitely see a boost if we could link the trails up so that they are able to do that by coming, you know, bike or ped to the downtown area. That's the long-term plan. You know, the other, the other sort of topic that we haven't uh, touched on is, you know, if we can attract, um, new businesses to uh, downtown uh, to either uh, existing um, existing properties or properties to uh, be redeveloped. That's um, obviously would be a big um, shot in the right direction and and um, would support a lot of people and a lot of everything else. Okay, is that, uh, I, I, I have another item here. I'm not familiar with what you want to talk about, uh, Sean, on strategy for UVVA and GRDC marketing. Okay, so I'm going to have Tracy help me out with that because that's a joint project that we're working on. And this okay. is one of the things that I originally talked about. You know, we, you don't have to look too far. We do have empty buildings in different parts of the city, which is not a good sign. We know. Our 12A commercial district is changing. We, it was going to change before COVID-19. We knew that anyway, due to online sales and those sorts of things. So that things are going to transition down there in one fashion or another. And it's going to be important more so than ever that the city market itself adequately. And uh, Tracy, if you would talk a little bit about what we're working on for right now. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so Sean and I have talked a little bit about this, and then um, I've been working with uh, Grafton Regional Development Corporation on some other projects um, for COVID-19 support of businesses. And as Ann Duncan Cooley, who's the executive director of GRDC, and I were talking, we, we learned that... Um, you know, we had some common goals for helping the economy go forward and helping in recovery. And she offered to serve as our fiscal agent if we wanted to submit a grant for the CARES Act funding um, for the nonprofit relief fund. And although that fund is dedicated to helping 50C, 501c3 nonprofits to recover from COVID. GRDC is a is a nonprofit that qualifies for the fund and and supporting and extending their services is under the grant um, eligibility requirements. So I submitted a grant with um, Sean's approval to them to create a marketing campaign for one for the city of Lebanon, but also for our region. And part of that would be for a website that focuses on uh, both business and workforce recruitment. Even though our unemployment rate right now is higher, due, you know, much higher than it was due to the uh, pandemic, we still have numerous businesses in this area that are looking for uh, specific talent and workforce. And generally what we're hearing and, and the state business and economic affairs has confirmed this, 
as well that there's uh, an interest in people from more urban areas relocating to our area and other parts of New Hampshire to get away from, you know, the pandemic. Um, the pandemic has really sort of brought to light that in some cases they, you know, these people would rather live in an area that has more, more open spaces. And we are very well positioned, I think, because we do have positions open. So we have uh, companies that need talent. Uh, we have infrastructure and we also have some empty buildings. And, you know, as those workforce comes here, there's also opportunities for them to become entrepreneurs, either through family members or they themselves. So this website would focus on that. It would be a recruitment website, and then it would be paired with a marketing initiative where we would target marketing to some of the urban areas, such as Boston and New York. Um, we'd be looking at doing paid advertising as well as social media. We would build in some sort of lead generation into the website. So if somebody was to visit the website, um, like Google, all of a sudden everything they see would be connected to the Upper Valley. And then we would also fund a uh, part-time position for six months to help follow up and manage that. Um, work with local employers on what their workforce recruitment efforts are field calls and referrals and leads from the website, provide resources to entrepreneurs that are looking to start a business, and network with other organizations such as GRDC, the Magnuson Center for Entrepreneurship, River Valley Community College, uh, Dartmouth Regional Tech Center. So we, we did submit this grant uh, Sean was talking about doing some in-kind support as well. So the actual cash amount of the grant was 50000 And the total amount of the grant is a little over 68000 with support from the city and also UVBA. Obviously, we don't know if it will be funded. The deadline to submit it is tomorrow. Um, but we do have the support of GRDC as well. And, and if we are not funded through this particular grant, we, we have a good outline and we can then start looking for other sources of funding. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I think it's an awesome idea. I'd love to see that happen. I think it'd be a great idea if we got this circulated to the committee. It's, a, it's an enormous uh, task and to uh, understand all of the issues, we probably need to be uh, looking at it in more depth. Uh, so is that the, uh, is there an outline or is there a proposal that's written at this time? I, I can send you the same thing that I sent to GRDC and, and you can take a look at it. Great. That will do. Let's get started with that. Okay. I think that's excellent. Okay. I guess we need to, uh, any other questions on this? Kevin? Haven't heard from you. No questions here. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Let's move on. Uh, COVID impact so, on the local economy and so recovery. Uh, COVID-19, of course, nobody knows what where this is going to go. Uh, there's a lot of uh, estimates as to what's going to happen. There's, uh, there's still talk that by late fall, early winter, we're going to have a vaccine, but that remains to be seen. Obviously, that would be a game changer if that does indeed happen. Um, even though the state of New Hampshire's uh, rates of infection are, have leveled off, which is a really good thing, the rest of the uh, large parts of the rest of the country are not so fortunate. 
And there is a concern that we are going to have further uh, outbreaks of infection as we get into the fall and the summer. And even in our own state, there's going to be a lot of more, a lot more human interactivity um, with beaches open and things of that nature. So there's certainly a risk here that we could see infection rates climb. Although I think the Hampshire strategy seems to be a little bit better than some of the other states that just rushed to open up. Uh, there was a more uh, planned approach here. So hopefully uh, things don't get worse, but they certainly could. And we that's what we need to prepare for is that happens and we end up with another state home order and things close down again. That would be rather traumatic if that happens. Um, but that remains to be seen. So there's obviously the biggest impact seems to be on the 12 a area. We've got stores that we knew were going to close anyway. Kmart and JC Penney were obviously in precarious situations and they're in their runout status down there. I don't know when they're actually going to close up if they haven't already done so. But there is interest in, in reoccupying those buildings. Both of the property owners have expressed that to our planning department, that they do have plans and at least they say they're not worried about being able to find tenants. Um, I went down to the powerhouse mall the other day, just had some pizza over there at Louis Louis and everything was closed up at like four or five o'clock. So I don't know what how things are looking there, where that what the future is of the powerhouse mall. I did speak to one of the property owners involved with that um, at the beginning of this COVID-19 crisis, and they were having some serious concerns about their ability to pay taxes, that sort of thing, but I haven't heard from them since then. So we, we've already, our planning, our, our zoning is already in place down there to allow for a lot of flexibility in 12A. So if things do need to shift down there, that can certainly happen. But what we're hearing from the large uh, shopping center owners is they do have other tenants they're looking at and they expect to have those properties full, filled. So I don't know what to take of it other than that. We certainly have open stores all over the place down there, storefronts. And that's certainly going to be an issue as time goes on. And whether we see a total change uh, and even potentially residential development in that area in the future, who knows? It remains to be seen. The tax um, payment plan that I've asked for from the governor, the emergency order, that uh, I spoke to him last Thursday about that, and he thought it had already been signed, but it's part of a package of two other emergency orders that are a bit more controversial that are being worked through. One of those is to allow the governing body of a town to change its budget in the middle of the year so they can reduce their tax rate by October. Cities have the authority to do that already, but towns do not. And that's a bit of a controversial issue. So that is, they're still weighing through that. And I'll be talking with the governor again tomorrow and hopefully he can sign that. We had talked about sending a letter out to businesses. Tracy has worked on that. We have a draft letter. We're just waiting for that emergency order so we can provide businesses uh, with some direction on how to fill out the application for the tax payment plan for those who may wish to avail themselves of that. So that's that's where we are with that. Any other thoughts on that or any other ideas? I'm certainly open to them. Looking for some input there. Yep. Um, this is Clifton here. I have a question. Um, Sean, is it really true that we haven't had any new cases of COVID-19 in Lebanon or it appears Grafton County like in over a month? No, we've had a couple of we've had a couple of cases, I think one like one or two. We, we know okay. we had at least one. One of them was our employee employee of ours. Okay. So. OK, it's just, it's just that the, uh, the graphic that um, I think it's WMUR or maybe it's the New York Times shows for Grafton County seems to show no, no, no new cases in quite a while. So I was just curious. Yeah, uh, like I say, I, I know of one. One of them was one of our employees. So well, maybe it's their residence is elsewhere. So maybe that's why it wasn't attributed to Lebanon. But who knows? It, yeah, you don't have to say more. Um, huh. Yeah, I, I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to chime in on, you know, my my sense of uh, some of the retailers in particular and in, in restaurants. I mean, I think the you know the restaurants seem to 
they are absolutely the the uh, business with the most uncertainty it's because they don't know if there's a um, you know if there's going to be a full recovery if we we're going to go back to a shutdown um, I mean I think the the positive with this I, I probably with other retailers as well is you know there is a big push to um, to uh, multiply their their sales channels and so you know those that haven't been that online by by force went online um, um, those like the restaurants you know that were able to do takeout and delivery and outdoor dining um, some of them have actually done extremely well um, so there's uh, you know the I think the the hard part is you know everybody's still down in terms of sales and everybody is uh, still has a lot of uncertainty I, I think the the good news is you know we've been put in a situation that is creating a lot of um, really pretty productive uh, creative ideas like you know taking over parts of streets for summer dining like um, doing more takeout venues um, uh, i had uh, somebody i was working with up at the airport that in the last three months uh, because of covid they ended up um, really driving the online sales this is an industrial client and they've now become like amazon's go-to supplier and they're they just tripled in size so there there are some there's some bright light stories out there but um you know i the likes of hypertherm and some of the other industrials they're still down i mean they were down 30 percent now they're down about 10 or 15 percent and they're slowly getting back but um Again, I, you know, I think what we should all pay attention to is, you know, some of the uh, more creative uh, things that have come out of this and try to build on those things that have worked. Chip, I, I agree. And I'm hearing that from our businesses as well, that um, a number of them have tried using new technologies. Um, for instance, I have a painting company that rather than doing in-person estimates is now uh, doing them virtually and is finding that that's working quite well for them. Um, I do have some concerns, though, about what's going to occur in the fall. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of businesses have applied for the federal relief programs, and they've received some funds from the PPP, or they've received an emergency loan or a grant from the EIDL program. Both of those are with SBA. Um, of course, the Main Street Relief Funds, uh, those checks went out last week uh, from the state. But I, I am concerned as to what's going to happen when those funds run out and that would be in the fall or towards the end of the year. And I, I think we have some businesses that are just kind of hanging on. I've also been talking with some businesses that are still having a lot of problems with their supply chain. Um, uh, one of them, uh, I was at West Lebanon Feed and Supply yesterday, and they are having some issues with their supply chain where, um, you know, there's been such a run on people buying certain items, you know, uh, gardening supplies, they can't keep those in stock. Um, you know, toilet paper, of course, has been, you know, the running joke since this all started. Um, but what some, some of the smaller retailers are finding is that uh, when they go to their suppliers, particularly those who, you know, have been successfully pushing out a lot of supplies for certain lines, uh, they're getting dropped because the smaller retailers or mid-sized retailers, they, they don't do enough business. So 
uh, those suppliers are pushing everything towards their bigger accounts and they're dropping the small ones. And that's making it really difficult for these smaller businesses to, um, to you know, get their lines stocked. So, you know, it's very much a mixed bag and there's still so much uncertainty as to what's going to happen in the fall that yeah, I do agree with you. There's a lot of bright spots, but I, I think that we're not out of the woods either. No, well, definitely not. Sorry, don't mean to be a downer. <laughs> no, I mean, it's 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 uh, it, it, it's very real. It's like we're definitely not out of the woods. And and, you know, that's that's the whole issue is people. It's very hard to plan when you don't know what you're planning for, you know. And uh, so. Yeah, we'll <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll have to see how it unfolds, but. Steve, you're muted. I know. There we go. Uh, did you have something, Sean? If... No, that, that's all I have. Those are the agenda items. And Well, I'd like to uh, bring up this last agenda item, number four, which is future agenda items. We have about uh, 10 minutes or eight minutes left here in the day in our meeting time. This is really important. What I'd like to hear from everybody, uh, or anybody that wants to speak, uh, you know, how... How should we get, we've heard a lot today. We, we need to focus a bit as we uh, now have many more things in front of us. As this starts to happen, we don't want to keep going wider and wider. We want to make sure we're driving towards uh, complete strategies. Any thoughts along those lines? Chip, you've been uh, speaking up. Uh, what's your thoughts here? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm all speaked out, but um, I, I think, um, you know, I think some of the initiatives uh, laid out by Tracy and Sean are are really worthwhile. And, and you know, there, there are things that will... Um, support things as as COVID figures itself out. And so I think if we we stay um, if we stay focused on town visioning and what uh, the broader goals are and try to um, pay attention to some of uh, the better things that have happened or events that are happening i.e. people moving in from out of state um, there there does seem to be a trend towards diversifying out of the city and um, hopefully we'll be able to um, take advantage of that to the city's uh, benefit so. okay let me ask you this pointed question uh, if you had a choice of the uh, developing more data about who's moving in along that lines or developing more of the marketing area, which would you pick? I would market. Okay. There's, there's, uh, an, an answer to where some strategy should be is make sure we continue the marketing. You want to hear about that next week, next month, excuse me. Sure. Um, Bill. Bill Dunn, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you. What's your thoughts? Uh, you, you're, you're involved in these meetings. Uh, how should we be helpful to the community as a, as a whole? Right. You know, I, I think when we, when, when we traditionally look at how businesses are affected, we look at retail and restaurant and hospitality, but there are a whole set of ancillary businesses that might have an opportunity to benefit in this uh, in this environment. And right now, uh, you know, maybe we have some conversations with realtors. From what I understand, they're incredibly busy right now. Uh, I know that uh, the uh, mortgage lending institutions are doing more business right now than they have ever done before. And that is not that is not all refinances because of the low interest rate environment. They're purchase transactions. So homes are going on the market. 
selling very, very quickly. And this is an influx of individuals. There's there are some folks who are sizing down locally and then folks who are moving in from from other locations. Uh, you know, the 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 folks coming into the area might want a more rural environment. Even downtown Lebanon is a rural environment to people coming from from other parts. So there is this is the front spin of some change that is happening, and it might be a, a new breath of, of, of new people into our area. So if we can provide them with the amenities, and this is why I, I think some of the the quick hits, like a, sprint, a Spencer Street redevelopment and a paving of the, the trail that might connect Bank Street all the way down to the skate park, just makes the town a more desirable place. You know, when the tunnel project's done, Arts and culture can get in there, give it a certain vibe. Uh, I think there's there's some positive aspect to that, which will then spur additional business opportunities. They might not be the same ones that we're traditionally used to looking at. There might be uh, uh, a different mix. Retail has been sliding in some capacity for a while, but it doesn't mean that there are not other opportunities. And I think. Uh, I don't know those of you who read the uh, the entrepreneur uh, section of the study that was done for the uh, River Valley Community College, but it, it's it's inviting new opportunity, and uh, yeah, I, I think if, if we stay on what we can consider quick hits as an as an economic development commission, Spencer Street is highly visible, tunnels highly visible. I think that shows that we're putting forth an effort. If we can get some wins, that, that goes a long way. Okay, that's great. Uh, I'd be admiss if I didn't get Cliff. Uh, what's the council speaking from a wider perspective? What's your thoughts, Cliff? Yes, um, I think um, the bigger question, you know, I think, well, the council is obviously concerned about um, the city budget and how that relates to. Um, uh, taxpayers, uh, both uh, residents who are uh, financially stressed and and businesses. Um, so I think I think there's a uncertainty and unease with the uncertainty um, around that, but just we just got to kind of move along methodically. Um, I, I do think there's a tendency among the council, of, you know, let's let's not give up on the good things we've been working on. We, we may have to slow down on some things just because we can't uh, afford to do everything that we maybe thought we could a year ago. Um, I mean, we we knew anyways that the city is at a point of uh, a financial sort of turning point or a hump that we got to get over with with the debt service. Uh, you know, sort of being at an all-time high for a couple of years, uh, for a few years uh, from the CSO accumulated projects. Uh, I mean, those are just a few thoughts. You know, I think, um, um, you know, we, we want to stay the course in terms of the vitality, uh, the economic vitality uh, that we have, uh, but, but, but doing it in a way that keeps it affordable for city residents. Good thoughts. Uh, unless anybody else has anything that they want to add, I think we could uh, look for any other business. Sean, you want to wrap things up at all? Uh, I don't really have anything else. Uh, like I said, this yep. we need to come back with you with a more detailed plan about what we're, what we're proposing in West Lebanon. We're going to want some feedback from you folks on that as that moves forward. Um, I'm going to add that for our next meeting. Uh, David apparently wasn't able to attend tonight, so we'll have him comment on that, give you the out outline of where that's going. Um, I think that's where the focus, and we should have some updates on COVID-19, obviously, by then as well. Yes, I would hope. Well, I'd call for a motion to adjourn then. Uh, I have one more thing. Um, okay. Uh, is there a way that somebody can get me some of the past agendas so I can kind of get caught up to speed between now and the next meeting? Um, and maybe I can have a little bit more input. Yeah, Andy, I'll send you can do that. a zip file with, with the, Yeah, I'll send you a zip file with the data. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Do we don't do we need a vote here? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I, I'll move we adjourn. Clifton below, move we adjourn. Dan Nash, second. Okay, Dan, thank you. All right, all in favor. Yeah, Chip. you got to do a roll call. Yep. Chip. Chip, yes. I'm reading down yeah, my yeah. list. Kevin Purcell. Bill Dunn, yes. Dan Nash, yes. Clifton Bilo, yes. Steve Whitman, yes. That's it, I guess. Very good. Thank you. Have a good night. Yep. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Uh,